so some of the ways that you can use Twitter beyond your day-to-day -day <clears throat> tweeting is um, going to conferences, tweeting conferences, um, cases, and tweet chats. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about conferences because that's really how I got into Twitter and still probably where I'm the most active on Twitter is live tweeting conferences like the one um, that I was just at and is still going on. And I love this quote because I think it's kind of cheesy but true. So attending a medical conference using Twitter is like a difference between driving a Mini or, and a Ferrari. And I have neither of those vehicles. Um, but it really is. It sounds cheesy, but once I started live tweeting conferences, it was almost like a third or fourth dimension um, opened up. It just made it so much more fun and added this entire layer of engagement with people at the conference that, um, you know, sometimes you're just sitting in a lecture room and it might be boring, but with tweeting, I'm literally never bored at conferences. I always feel like I'm on 100% of the time. So, you know, why would you tweet from a conference? Um, because, you know, conferences are big and lots of people are there, but not everyone. And so it's a way to enhance the reach of the knowledge that's shared there. Certainly, it's a great way to network. You know, conferences in general are a great way to go and meet people in your field and network for either academic productivity or future jobs, certainly. Um, and you can make new friends and followers. It's, you know, every time I come back from a conference, I have a lot more followers, so that's really fun. Um, certainly, you can virtually attend from home. So I, the big pathology conference is still going on. I'm here on service and giving this talk, which is great, but I can still follow what's going on at the conference and see little tweeted pearls from the sessions, which is really fun. Um, and then you know, it's really a real-time international discussion of topics. So for instance, if I'm in a session talking specifically about endocrine pathology, I can, you know, look on Twitter, you know, kind of virtually look around the room and see what people are um, saying in response to what the speakers are giving. So it's almost like we can have a little bit of a real-time conversation um, while the speaker is lecturing. That doesn't sound very good, but it's kind of a way for us to bounce ideas off each other. Um, uh, that's, that's really neat as well. And then certainly it's great for social events, meeting up, you know, you can tweet out like, hey, free beer in, you know, conference room A. And look, you've just gotten a whole bunch of new friends and followers and you can meet them in real life. And then how to do it, um, check your conference's social media policy. I think in this day and age, you know, it's pretty much a given that unless you specifically forget, uh, forbid it, that people are going to tweet from your talk. But you definitely want to make sure the conference, um, if they have one, most of the larger ones will have a social media policy. Um, often the conference will have an official hashtag, so, you know, ASCO, RSNA, USCAP, and then, you know, CAP15. And you want to announce that you're tweeting from the conference, what you're going to be tweeting, just give your followers an idea of what you're going to be doing. And you definitely want to attribute properly. So if you type something, say who said it. Ideally, if they have a Twitter handle, use that. But if not, say, you know, Dr. Hong from Duke says blah. Because um, it's really important, um, especially with social media, to attribute what is not your own work. And then just a little bit, you know, tweet pearls that stand alone. So, you know, if you're at a conference, you're getting to hear the whole conversation, but the people on Twitter are just getting your one tweet. So you want to make sure that what you're tweeting is going to be something that is understandable on its own without a whole lot of background. And definitely tweet media, tweet slides um, from the slide deck or use a photo fixing app. So this is an example of a talk uh, from one of our Duke residents at USCAP this uh, March. And you can see this is the original photo um, and you can see this lovely uh, man's head and the back of the projector. It just, you know, it's okay, you can see it, it's fine, but it's just not as good. And um, I use this app called Office Lens. It's free, it only takes a few seconds, really. It automatically crops it into something which looks much better. You can still see kind of the top of his head, but it's not so obvious. Um, and then, you know, you want to kind of interact with others, tweet social opportunities, and of course, you know, take a break once in a while. Don't just look at your phone the whole time because that defeats the whole purpose. You know, you don't want to just be like tweeting from social hour and not actually socializing. And then always bring a battery back up. Um, so uh, I always uh, run out of battery about halfway through the day. So, you know, just get one on Amazon. It's like 15 bucks. It'll charge your phone and you'll be happy about that. In fact, this is just tips for life. I mean, we all live off our smartphones. If you don't have a battery backup, you need one. It will save you so much. Um, and then this is just an example of kind of USCAP 2015. This happened in March. And on very short notice, uh, Jared Gardner, who you see kind of pictured here, you know, we call him the godfather of pathology social media, um, kind of was invited by this big, very prestigious academic uh, group, uh, USCAP, you know, to put together a live tweet group. And, you know, as part of it, there's me, my tiny head up there. 
Um, and on really very short notice, we got a lot of people interested. They actually made us ribbons. So I always wanted to get one of those, you know, distinguished attendee ribbons. Um, and now I got my, this is not mine, obviously. Um, but we had these little ribbons. And so we walked around and people could see like, what is that weird ribbon? Why do you have pound signs? What's going on? And so it gave us a, an opportunity to be able to talk to people, sign people up for Twitter, um, and gave us a little bit of official recognition because, you know, they put big posters of this up uh, in the registration area. So it was a great way to get our name out there. And then in terms of, you know, this hashtag, this was only one of the hashtags that we were using from the meeting. And even just, you know, having put this together in a few short weeks before the meeting, um, we got, you know, 5.8 million impressions. And for the first time this has been done at this meeting, I think it was really impressive um, and certainly um, very promising moving forward. And uh, you can see RSNA 14 had a lot more impressions. So again, I think the radiologists um, definitely have been doing this a lot longer. There's a little more um, buy-in on Twitter from radiology, but I think it just shows the power of what Twitter can do. So I'll turn it back to Jenny. Thank you, Sarah. I can't believe I made her do all of that with her voice. I feel I'm so, so guilty. sorry. Thank you guys for bearing with me in my terrible voice. That's fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to finish off Twitter, Beyond Twitter 101, with um, two quick sections on tweeting cases and then um, tw tweet chats. So tweeting cases, why would you do it? Um, it's a great way to get lots of followers, retweets and favorites. So this is very self-affirming. It makes you feel um, good when you sleep at night. Um, but more than that, for me, it's a, a great way to teach and reach a lot more people with the excellent cases we get at Duke and, and your respective institutions and then um, to learn about medicine yourself. Because if you're tweeting a case and you're thinking, what would I ask a resident or a fellow about this, then I'm actually reading up and looking up um, additional facts. And then how do you do it? Uh, the most effective way is to obviously put the image there and make it an unknown and then have a link to the answer. Because one of the most annoying things is someone putting out a picture and saying, what is this? And then you never know what it is. And um, that's not very good. So here's an example of one I just did very recently. Um, this is um, a question, what artery is responsible for this infarct? What is a clinical triad? And then I have a, in bold the answer and then the a link to the answer. Now the uh, answer website, the URL actually showed the answer. So that's why I've used a Google shortener to actually give it a, a few little letters and numbers and mask the answer. And then I hashtag NeuroRad because I think it's more like a NeuroRad level rather than a RadRes level. <coughs> and that link takes you to an excellent Radiopedia article which talks about the artery of Hirschhorn and then the clinical triad. Okay, tweet chat. Um, why would you do it? Uh, it's a great way to interact with the community. It, you're directly chatting with experts who are moderating the session. And along the way, you get ideas to improve research or clinical practice. And an ex an example I showed you earlier was that conversation we had about, hey, if you think radiologists give you bad reports, then we have to tell them what is bad. And that led to a series of articles. Um, how um, you look up times for the tweet chat and use the hashtag of the tweet chat to follow the conversation and then to tweet. Uh, the JACR has uh, monthly tweet chats on Thursdays at about noon. And prior, the month prior to the tweet chat, I'll actually have the topic, who's um, talking, who's moderating, and then the questions. So you can just look up their website. Um, I thought I'd just take a snippet out of the tweet chat that I was involved in. Uh, and the tweet chat has a question. There's usually about three to four questions. So, And then the T2 um, is the topic two, or sometimes it might be a Q but it just labels what the question was. So what are the strategies to foster communication between radiologists and clinicians or patients? And they use the JACR um, hashtag, which is something, which is a hashtag people would look up if they were wanting to follow the tweet chat at that time. And then um, an answer. I use the T2 because I'm re responding to this uh, question. And here I'm saying uh, we need a shift in attitude to radiologists, spend more time thinking beyond the work list, be available, craft reports to be valuable. And I've used the hashtag because there are people that are following this tweet chat that don't follow me. So if I don't put in this hashtag, they're not gonna see my tweets. 
And then I've also um, yeah, put in the topic and then I've mentioned Radiology Journal in case they want to respond to this or they may want to retweet this because otherwise they're just sort of searching in the sea of tweets and not knowing that I'm directing this question at them. Um, there's someone else who um, has a tweet that um, if you're just reading this tweet alone, you're not knowing that it's not really making sense responding to this question and they've actually marked T1, which is the previous question that just came out afterwards. And then there's someone else who doesn't actually mention what question they're responding to, but it sounds really interesting. Um, she's a resident and she loves follow showing cases and explaining the imaging. And if I wanted to find out what she was actually responding to, I can just click on this view conversation and see what she was responding to in the context of that comment. And then I can join in and, and talk as well. Okay, so um, we've finished with 10 minutes spare for lots of um, questions and for people who are actually on Twitter to actually chime in as well. But before that, I want to give you the conclusion of what this we've said in the last hour. And uh, given this is a talk about Twitter, these conclusion points should be tweetable. So I, I welcome you to tweet these out. So the first tweetable point is, and it's less than 120 characters, is Twitter in medicine has many unexpected advantages the biggest mistake is not to try it out. And I would have not tried it out if I hadn't had someone hack into my phone and install the <coughs> Twitter app. So please try it out. The second um, tweetable point is the best way to learn Twitter basics is actually get on it. Um, do it for a week. See what other people are doing, what's effective. Tweet yourself and see what the response is. And uh, doing that, you'll know what is actually a good tweet and what is a bad tweet. And then the third tweetable point is that Twitter advantages and fun increase exponentially if you go beyond 101 and you engage. So tweet content, tweet at conferences, tweet chat. Okay, and that is it. Thank you so much for being a great audience. And I will take questions.